Hey, welcome back. This is lecture 14 and it's going to be on tree traversals. Last time we talked about various implementations of trees, uh, specifically we brought mention to the binary search tree, or binary tree rather, which is what we'll be talking about for the next few lectures. And when we talk about tree traversals, we have a um, interesting uh, problem before us. And that problem is that for something like a list or an array, a traversal is, is rather straightforward. You have the elements in a linear order already element one, element two, element three. And so a traversal typically just involves starting at the beginning and traversing to the end. Uh, or alternately, you could start at the end and traverse towards the beginning. But because the elements are arranged in a line, moving across that line is a very apparent means of traversal. On the other hand, we could have a tree. And that, just to throw up an example, might look like this. We have some root pointer pointing to some node x. And as I said before, I'm going to tend to draw the trees in just this diagram format. We could draw the actual nodes themselves, the rectangles with a left and a right pointer, and the third field, which would be, be the element. But since it basically is just a representation of this format, we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and draw trees like this, typically, where we just have, um, I may draw the arrows or I may not, but just two lines coming down from the node, and that will be the, X, or the left and the right pointers. We have a Z here and a W here, and we have here, say, B, and we have here H, and we have Q, and maybe we have K from there. So when we have such a tree, the question becomes now, what does it mean to do a traversal on a tree like that? Because as you can see, there's a number of different paths we could do. And some of them would just be completely random uh, hodgepodge type things, you know, jumping from H to A to X to Q to K. Just as with the list or an array, we could jump from element 3 to 5 to 1 to 7 to 2 to, to 13. And, and that wouldn't necessarily make as much sense. But there would be things that would follow from this tree structure, just as going from element 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 followed from the uh, list or array structure. And those things might well involve uh, for example, as we'll look at for the first three implementations, whatever traversal we're on for the whole tree, doing it in isolation on an individual subtree is part of that operation. So in whatever order we're trying to traverse over things, we might say, okay, at some point that we're going to follow that same traversal on just the left subtree itself. Because the left subtree is a tree, just like the whole thing is a tree. We have a pointer to the root x, which has subtrees. We have a pointer to a, which has subtrees. And so that's one nice thing about the recursive nature of trees is whatever operation you can apply to the entire thing, you can apply to a small subtree part of it as well. Just as if you pulled any given section out of a linked list, that too is going to be a linked list. You know, it just has uh, now, now uh, if you pull elements three through five out of the linked list, then three could become the head and five would be the tail. Um, but basically there is this concept of a linked list structure, you know, being a, uh, created such that individual sublists inside are also linked lists themselves. And the same thing applies here. We view this as the entire tree, but if we were to grab sort of a small subtree off and deal with just that, that's a tree as well. And so there's no harm dealing with that, just as we could have um, dealt with uh, recursive functions in linked lists. And I alluded to that briefly at the start of the discussion, and I'd mentioned that for courses like our CS125 here, you would have seen uh, dealing with the list recursively rather than the way we, we um, dealt with it. Um, that, that would be uh, an example. Here we're actually going to deal with recursion again. And for those who haven't dealt with it extensively, the first example I go through, I will be reminding everyone sort of how recursion works. Uh, and then the other two I'll just sort of say, okay, now these work in similar ways. But uh, since trees are, are recursive structures, we tend to make very heavy use of recursion on trees. Uh, where we don't necessarily have to do that with lists, because if we don't want to, we can still proceed in order from element 1 to 2 to 3. Since we're having here a choice of whether to go to A or B, and then somehow if we want to visit both, we have to return back to X. Say from X we pick element A and proceed downward from there. If we eventually want to return to X so we can pick element B then afterwards, we have to somehow get back to X. And so we didn't have that problem with the linked list, that we didn't have to backtrack and choose a different path. There was only one path from beginning to end where with a tree we have a couple paths that we can uh, go uh, forward from at each node. Uh, it would be more than two paths if we had a non-binary tree, and I'll briefly mention that at the end of this lecture. But uh, for a binary tree, uh, we have two paths that we can follow 
from, downward from every node. And so this idea of going back to your, your nodes, you can proceed down the second path after you've already traveled down the first one, means uh, we want some way of getting back to that node that we didn't need to worry about with the linked list. And so even though we could get away without using recursion on lists, we could have used recursive or non-recursive uh, functions. With trees, recursion tends to be far more useful uh, because of that reason. Because we often, for our algorithms, do want to get back and say, and now it have traversed down the subtree pointed to by x as first pointer, now move to the subtree pointed to by x as second pointer. And so getting back to x so you can find that second pointer is often very useful. And so recursion is often very useful for getting back to that point. That said, the format being followed by our um, functions here is going to be one as follows. Um, I'm not going to worry about scoping this to any particular, um, any particular class. I'm just going to write out the algorithm, so take this as pseudocode, I guess. Though most of it will be pretty accurate code. I'm writing this on an overhead slide in case the uh, video seems slightly darker on this side than on this side. The idea is that I don't want to keep scribbling all over this diagram because I want to keep using it over again. So I'm just going to keep kind of writing an overhead slide I can mess with and then replace very easily. So this is new for this video, um, but I've tried it out beforehand and it looks like it works uh, and that it doesn't make, show up badly on the video, so I think we'll be okay. Um, so the two key parts of this are going to be this line and this line. And you're looking at this thinking, well, why am I not finishing off? Why am I writing this blank line here instead of a name? And the answer is that the uh, dealing with this method that I'm writing out here, the um, I, the uh, uh, concept here is that these, this will be sort of the key feature of the three of the traversals that we look at. Now, the reason there's that blank line is that they all have very similar names. The first traversal is going to be called pre-order. And so I'm going to write that in here. But I basically wrote that blank uh, before that because uh, the only thing that's going to change in terms of the name of these three first three algorithms is the uh, name, or is the prefix itself. So we'll have pre-order, and that's going to mean something special. And then the next algorithm we look at will be called in order, and the third one will be called post order. And so I'm writing that line there to remind you as you look at this that all we're really changing as far as the name goes is the, the prefix. It's also to emphasize that prefix because the remaining part or one of the remaining parts about this algorithm that is very important is where in particular the uh, output needs to go or visitation to some degree. Um, what, we have to, what I have to worry about here is the idea of a uh, visitation of some kind. We're, we're worrying about going over every single node in a traversal, and often that traversal is for printing, often it's for searching, and, and you can use the linked list analogy. Traversing down the linked list, node by node, would, be, would involve looking at each of the nodes in succession for printing out the value in that node. Or for searching, you'd search, you do a traversal, you look at each node in succession and say, is the value in this node the one I'm looking for? And the same thing's the case with the tree. We're trying to go to each node, and so there's some visitation procedure we're concerned with. The example here will be printing out the value in the node, but we could just as well have used the same concept for searching, which is why um, if we're going to make use of a traversal, we're just going over the basic idea of the traversal here, but these traversals can then be used in other methods, such as if you're going to try and write a, a, a function for searching on the tree, you could use a pre-order traversal, for example, to work a search. Your visitation line, where you'd replace the output line I'm about, about to write with a line that says, you know, look at the element in this node and see if it matches the one you're looking for. And you'd probably have some sort of key up here that you pass in as well. So the traverses we're looking at are the very basic concepts. We will certainly have to, um, you can certainly make use of these traversals as a portion of a larger algorithm as well, or to extend them in some way. The, the uh, point here is simply these are various orders in which we could move along the nodes of the tree. So the idea of pre-order is that we will, what we will be doing here is moving the um, output line or having the output line first so that we have here TN element. And I'm just going to abbreviate ELEM for element because I only have so much room on the paper here. So if with pre-order, we are printing the element in the node out first, and then we are moving down to the individual subtrees. 
So I will recursively say, OK, once we print out the element in the root, which is x, then run preorder on the entire left subtree, and then run preorder on the entire right subtree. And that's how we're going to uh, work this algorithm. Now, when we switch to in order, the difference will be that we are simply move the output line. Pre stands for before. So make that tie in, in your mind. Pre means before. That means that the output line goes before the recursive calls. For in order, in is short for in between. The output line will go in between the recursive calls. And when we look at post order, post means after. The output line will go after the recursive calls. So the only difference, aside from changing the name from pre to uh, in order to post order, the only difference in dealing with these uh, three first three traversals will be that I'll move the output line from here to here to here from before the recursive calls to in between them to after them. The recursive calls always do left recursive call first and then the right recursive call. So those, that order won't change. All it changes is the position of the output line. Now, there's one last thing to worry about here, but I'm not going to write it in quite yet. The thing we have to worry about is the um, uh, base case. This being a recursive algorithm, we need a base case. Otherwise, we would call recursion indefinitely until we run out of memory and crash, or crash for other reasons. I'm not going to put that in until we get to the point where we need it so that it will be very clear from our discussion what base case would be needed. Rather than me throwing it up there right now and you going, oh, I guess, um, I'll make the case for the, what base case we should have first. Make the argument that, okay, here's the base case we need and it should be apparent why when we get to that point. So, um, this said now, this is pre-order. And now one thing, we can do, one thing we can do here is consider exactly how this should be called. So I'm going to leave this slide up for the moment, or I'm going to take it down, but I will put it back. I'm going to leave the picture of the tree up. Um, one thing we might do, actually, let me not do that. I'll put the picture of the tree back, too. One thing we might worry about here is, obviously, what I want to do here is start at the root. It doesn't do me any good to start you know, lower down in the tree if I want to make sure I print out the root. So one thing I might do here is say, well, I'm going to pass the root pointer in to preorder. And that means my first parameter is going to be the root. Um, and I can actually throw this up here for a moment. That means the first parameter would be the root. And, and then when we make the recursive call, this would be the uh, node that we're dealing with in the second recursive call. And then that would be the node we're dealing with in the recursive call from there, and so on. So what we, uh, when we deal with the root of the tree, that's where we want to start. And typically, for all our tree traversals and all our tree algorithms, the root will be where we want to start. And the problem is you think, well, if this is what the client of a class is going to call, or the user of a certain class, pre-order some public function, the user shouldn't have access to root any more than they would have access to head in the linked list. That's a, we want that data member to be sort of hidden away in the implementation. Uh, in the linked list, we talked about iterators very briefly, and we have the idea of you can have an iterator to that first node, but you don't want the user to be able to mess with the head pointer because then they can call delete on it and get rid of the entire list, or at least the first node, and then lose the rest of the list. And likewise here, they shouldn't have access to the root pointer. So typically what's done here is that instead, in any given class, the pre-order function, for example, if you're just going to have, this is a, you, the documentation here would say pre-order for the purposes of printing out. This would specifically be meant to print. And then any other code that needed to use a pre-order-like traversal would simply have that kind of code built in as part of its implementation. But typically, if you're just going to have pre-order as a function to actually call, then that function would be a printout function rather than you know, copying or whatever else, in which case the structure would be built into the copy function, but it wouldn't be called pre-order. So that would be the user function. They just say run you know, pre-order, printout, and pre-order order on this tree, but there would be no argument passed in. And the argument, the implementation of this, would then be this piece of code. And if you are not familiar with this, you can indeed go ahead and write things like that. Uh, I alternatively could have put a semicolon here and then move this to the dot h. But if you want just to go ahead and put this in the dot c, it is possible, or in the dot h, it is possible to do that rather than having this in the dot h and that in the dot c. Typically, it's only done for one or two line functions, and you shouldn't get in the habit of doing it. But we will address that uh, a little bit later on in section, I believe or a little bit later on in the class, we will address at some point the idea of having some of the function implementation inside the, the .h code. Here, I'm just basically doing it to save space in the paper. But keep in mind, you could just as well have put that function call, put that whole thing in the .c, and just have the pre-order declaration. 
So don't let that mess you up. Right now, focus on the concept of what we're doing here, not, oh, that belongs in the .h, and that should be in the .c. This is, this is legal, but don't worry about you know, when or when you shouldn't use it. The key point is what I'm trying to accomplish here with the public versus private. And we'll talk about the other parts of this later on. So both of these would be void, of course. And then we would have tree node pointer tn. And then the idea would be the code that we're starting to write in the other slide would be in a dot c. So here's your dot h. Preorder takes no arguments. And its implementation, which you could have written in, in the dot c instead, is that the, we have one line you call preorder on root. So here's an example of method overloading. We have two preorders in the class, one that takes no arguments, and that's going to be public, and one that takes one argument, and that happens to be private. So the public, the implementation of the public method can invoke a private one, and then the private one would be the one that takes a pointer and therefore lets the recursion work. And so that would be how this would be done. If we want to make that our recursive function, well, since it takes no arguments, we can't pass the pointer over and over and over again. So for the recursion to work, um, if we want to build this into the tree, we, we need to be passing a pointer each time. And so this is often how that sort of thing is done. Uh, since we want recursion, we want to be able to pass a tree, uh, a point, tree node pointer as an argument, but yet we don't want the users to have access to root and to have to call things like that. Then we simply have two preorders, and the user calls the non-argument one, and then that will call in turn as part of its implementation the tree node uh, pointer parameter preorder. Say that three times fast. So, so keep that in mind. But that said, that's how to, this is typically done. And then that implementation of the private method would be what we're busy sketching out here. So now observing how this happens, let's consider sort of drawing the recursive uh, stack that we might deal with here. And I'm going to draw that in um, here. Sort of say, OK, this is. code, your actual HTML slide to the left or to the right of this might not look exactly the same way um, in terms of where this picture shows up with respect to everything. And if you need to scroll around a bit to see alternatively the stack I'm going to draw and then the tree and the code, that's OK. Um, in the class, we'd have four whiteboards to draw this all out on. I'm very constrained here by having a very limited amount of space on this piece of paper with which to draw everything at once. And so I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually nestle the picture in right under the code. Um, and if not, I apologize. Uh, we're going to be doing these slides uh, momentarily. And uh, we'll see if that works. But if not, then just you'll have to scroll around a little bit on that HTML page, because the, what I'm about to draw will really be a little bit below you. And I apologize if that's the case. But it may, be, it may turn out to be the best we can do. So. Um, Recall from lecture two that we have stack frames for our uh, function calls. When we call a function, there's an area set aside on the, on the stack or, or in local memory. This would be for all the various um, data and such of the, call, of the function we're in. And so there would be, you know, be some main above us. But let's say however long this stack extends upwards, here is the first call to preorder. And so from here, we have a TN that happens to point to X. The idea here being that when we deal with this picture, what we have is that this is TN, and I'm going to call it TN sub 1. Sorry about that. This will take some getting used to. We have TN sub 1 there. And the reason for that, and we're losing some of the tree, We have tn sub 1, and the reason for that is that we pass root into preorder, as you saw in the previous slide. And so because we've passed root into preorder, that means then that we pass by value. So the value, the address stored inside root, which is a pointer, therefore it holds an address, the address held inside the variable root is now stored inside the parameter tn. Both parameter and the original variable hold the same address, and that was passed by value. And so that's why I've written tn here. tn is a local pointer that's going to point to x. And there is some other pointer to x from you know, the previous code or where, wherever else root is stored. Actually, root wouldn't be a local variable of the previous code. So there's some other variable from dynamic memory, some other pointer root that's pointing to, um, pointing to x. 
But don't worry about that. The point here is that it's this low TN we're worried about. Because now when I say print out TN arrow element, what I'm going to print out here is X. And then I will call preorder. So now from preorder, we're calling preorder. And recall from recursion, that doesn't make a difference. And, and I'm hoping you've seen recursion before. If you haven't, then try and catch on with this rough explanation. All recursion is, of course, is calling a function from the same function. And so preorder calls itself. That's recursion. Um, but the idea here, then, is that we're calling preorder again. And that doesn't make any difference. We can run the same code segment because the system keeps track for each of these stack frames of exactly what's going on. So here's our second call. We have our own local variable TN. And this time it points to A. So the first the stack frame of the first call holds a pointer to X. But when we hit this line and called preorder, that stack frame was put on hold. We stored the instruction we have to jump back to when we return to the first call. And then we jump right away. We create a stack frame for the second call. And then that says, well, we passed in this pointer, X's left pointer. And so TN will hold that same address. And X's left pointer holds the address of A. So the TN in the second call will hold the address of A. And so I'm just going to notate that in this picture by TN sub 2, TN of the second call. That's the idea here is it, it, people often get confused with recursion and say, well, wait a minute, if I'm dealing with the same code, how does it all work? The answer is this code, when it gets compiled, is just a bunch of machine instructions. And you can have them running simultaneously as many times as you want. We just simply have here various stack frames indicating, well, now this is our local variable. So TN has changed, which is why it is, in a sense, different code. But the original code you actually, when this, wherever this code is compiled and running, it's defined in terms of TN. So when you know what TN is pointing to, well, then you're running the code segment on that particular address instead of that particular address. And then the other thing to worry about is, well, how do I know where to jump back to? And the answer is, well, each of these stack frames would store, stay, when I return from the second call, jump back to this particular line of the first call. And then when I return from the first call, jump back to the line in whatever function I, just ca I came from originally. So each stack frame will tell you where to jump back to. And the only difference will be, here we're running in our entirety a preorder. And when we finish with that, we will jump back to some other line in the same preorder function will just be then running that, that preorder function on different data. So that's how the computer distinguishes your different recursive calls. You literally have a different segment in memory for each call. And that segment in memory says what your TN stands for this time. And, and if you leave that function, um, where you're supposed to jump back to in the function that called this one. And so recursion is not anything that doesn't work. It works exactly the same way other methods do. You hold your local variables, and you hold where you're supposed to jump back to, what line you call this function from originally back in, in, in the function you, you, that called this one. And it just sometimes confuses people because we're saying, well, we're in preorder, and then we go to preorder. It doesn't matter. Here we say, um, I, 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 when I return from, from this function back to this one, I should jump to preorder the uh, preorder left call, and I've finished that. And when I call from the second, a third preorder call, I will likewise say in the third preorder call, when we're done with me, jump back to the second call at this particular line that said preorder TN arrow left, and you're finished with that one. So, so it doesn't matter that you had 18, you have 18 preorder calls active at once. When you return from the 18th, you're going to jump back to some particular line in the 17th call and say, okay, run preorder, but start at this point because you've done the earlier stuff. So it takes a bit of getting used to if you haven't done that before, but once you do, then, then you're all set. Um, so what happens here is now we say um, TN points to A. And then we say, well, now we're running this code on the node A. And we print out, run the out printout line, which prints out A. And then we say, now I'm going to call preorder TN arrow left. And TN, of course, is this T, the one that points to A. So TN arrow left is A's left uh, pointer. And that points to Z. So we're calling, we're in passing this pointer in as an argument to the third recursive call. And so I'm going to write here on the slide that this will be TN sub 3. That was visible. Let's do it this way. TN sub 3, that's a pointer to Z here. And so, and here we can notate that here in our third call. This is a pointer to Z. And so, there we go. Um, now, of course, then this is, this is the TN for the third call. And when we say print out the element, 
and call it on the fourth call. Since I didn't draw any, any nodes here, you should assume that there's null pointers because if, you know, that, that's the assumption here. There are null pointers. That's why we're not drawing the children. So when I make my fourth call, I say I print out Z, and then on T and arrow left, I'm calling um, preorder. So I'm passing this pointer in as an argument, which means in my fourth call, that's my value. And so here we have TN, and the fourth call is pointing to null. And we say, well, what do we do about that? TN arrow element will cause a segmentation fault because TN doesn't really point to anything. And I remember the subscripts are not really part of the name of the variable. I'm just using the 1, 2, 3, and 4 to indicate what call they're from. So the answer here is, well, this is now where a base case comes in. Because if we're worried about a base case, we can now say uh, if TN is not equal to And we proceed with all of this. If it is equal to null, we won't bother. We'll skip over all of it and just end. So the idea is this function does nothing if Tn is equal to null. If, it's not, if it, if it uh, is not equal to null, then we will proceed. And so there's our base case. Um, apparently the, not quite getting all this stuff. The, um, the idea here and now is that we will hit this null. We'll notice, well, a TN here is null. We return immediately, and now the fourth call exits, and we're back in the third call. So now this, forget about this. We're back in the third call, and how did we know to jump back to this line? Well, when we made the fourth call, we stored a bit of information that said when you return to the third call, skip over those lines and start right after the TN arrow left. Start right there. And that was stored in the fourth call, so when we returned from the fourth call, we knew we should jump back here, run the preorder code stored in memory on this set of variables, and start here, because you've already done the earlier stuff. So, and that would, you'd return that way whether you're dealing with recursive functions or not, but, but um, that would be how it can work despite the fact that these are all running preorder. You're just jumping back and running that same, these same instructions again, but different spots. So from here, we now jump back into this point and say run the code starting at this point on these variables. And so we say, well, now I've called TN arrow left, and now I have to call TN arrow, call it on TN arrow right, which would be this null pointer. So we have make yet another fourth call. From here, we'd say, well, from the third call, call, make the fourth call. And so we enter a fourth call where TN points to null again, just like I've scratched out here. We realize it's null right away. We exit. We return from the fourth call back to the third. And that's gone. And we're back in the third call. Except now, we're back here. Because now when we made the fourth call, we said, when you return, since you called it from this line, when you return, you should return back to this point. And so when we return from the fourth call back to the third, we'll now be jumping to that point in the code for the third call. And we say, well, now we're done, because we've done this and this and this on this third call collection of data. Now we're done. And it's time to return back to the second call. So TN goes away, and we're now we're back in this collection of data we've jumped up to this point because that's what the instruction would have been here. It would have been, when I entered this third call, it was from this line. So when you return back to the second call, return to right after that, second, that, that line there. Which means now when we return, we're going to be running the second call, but starting here because that's where we left off. And that means what we have to do next is run that line, which means we'll now make a third nested call again, but this time it'll be with TN of the third call being on W, and so on and so forth. So what's going to happen here is we print out W, make a fourth call to K, make a fifth call to K's null, left null and return, make a fifth call to K's null on the right pointer and return. Then we return from K back to the third call, and then we make a fourth call to W's right, which is null, and then we return. And now we're done with W. So we've done the root, or the printing out the element, recursively called on the left subtree, recursively called on the right subtree. We return from W back to A. And now we will have been here. Now I finished my call to A's right pointer. And now I can return from A back to X, at which point I will again be here. Because I would have had instructions written in this call that said, I called on A, the pointer to A from this line. So when I return, I should return right after that line in the call to X. So I'm trying to liberally talk about the mechanics of how the machine would arrange this as well. All we really need to care about is we pass through this code and return from it. And, and if we happen to call recursive call in the meantime, then we run the code on, on 
run this code on that pointer before going on. But if you're wondering how it's all organized in the machine and how on earth would that ever work, well, this is how. So that said, now we're back in X, and now we'll proceed with the right subtree, and we'll print out B, and then H, and then Q. And so that's the pre-order traversal, X, A, Z, W, K, B, H, Q. Now, the way to deal with this, um, I'm going to write this out on a separate slide. So that's been a little quick review of recursion as well in terms of how this, how you'd actually go through this code and run it. Now I'm going to go ahead and write results here and say, okay, pre-order traversal is going to be, and the way you want to solve this problem is as follows. You want to say, well, when I try and, and figure out what's going on here, I notice that I've got the root and then a bunch of stuff in the right, in the uh, left subtree, and I don't really care about the order, and then a bunch of stuff in the right subtree, and I don't really care about the order. So look at it that way first. Root, left subtree, right subtree, that's how pre-order works. The root comes first, or your element comes first, and then the left subtree, and then the right, right, right subtree. Once you've gotten that structure established, then worry about the details here. Okay, now in terms of the left subtree, how would that really work? Well, look at A is the root, and then the stuff in the left subtree is that, and the stuff in the right subtree is that. And then say, okay, now, how would this work? Well, Z is the root, and then there's nothing in the left subtree and nothing in the right subtree. And how would this work? Well, W is the root, and then K is the left subtree, and there's nothing in the right subtree. And then clearly, of course, that's done by doing K. And then same thing over here. How does all that work? Well, B is the root. Those are the items in the left subtree. Those are the items in the right subtree. And again, when you only have one item in the tree, it's clear what the traversal is. So if you are not at the point yet where you can just kind of glance at the tree and quickly go, oh, yeah, X, A, Z, W, K, B, H, Q, then the way to do that is to consider it this way and say, well, just write out the pattern, root, everything in left subtree, everything in right subtree, and sort of view that as the high-level outline, and then progressively refine your detail by saying, okay, now, now I know the left subtree elements are printed before X, uh, or after X, before HBQ, but in what order should they be printed? And then you figure out that order by looking at that level of detail, by saying, okay, now here's this subtree, what order should those be printed out if we're running pre-order on that left subtree? So you sort of progressively refine things, and then you just read across, and you can see here now that X, A, Z, W, K, B, H, Q is the traversal order. X, and then the left subtree A, uh, Z, W, K, B, H, Q. So that said, now it's, uh, the other two are relatively straightforward. If we're going to deal with in order, I'll come back to that slide and put that back up. Um, if we're going to deal with in order here, we're dealing with uh, void node pointer tn. And we will have here um, whatever order if tn is not equal to null, then we have whatever order here, tn arrow left, and whatever order tn arrow right, and that would be the end of the code. And the actual template we're using here fills in for in order. So we're going to look at in order. And we said now for in order, the name is in order here. And the C outline comes in between, or whatever our visitation line is. TN arrow element. So there we go with that. And the idea then is that this is the in order code. Um, so we have the same pattern we had before. The difference is that the C outline has moved from before to in between the recursive calls, and the name of the function has changed. That's all that's changed. And so if we want to write out the traversal order here, we note that the idea then becomes, well, we have everything here that's inside the uh, left subtree in some order, Z, W, K, and A, then the root, then everything in the right subtree, which is H, B, Q. 
When we're done with that, we then say, well, let's now look at the left subtree. How would that have actually been done in detail? Well, we'd have everything in its left subtree, then its root, then everything in its right subtree. That's just a one element tree, so we know how that gets done. And with here, we'd have everything in the left subtree, followed by the root, followed by where well, there is no right subtree of W. And of course, we know how that's done too, because that's just one node. And then same thing here. Everything in the left subtree, followed by the root, followed by everything in the right subtree, and then those are just one node trees, so those are straightforward. So again, this progressive refining of detail, where in any given circled area, you say, well, now how would this really have been printed? Well, now break that down, look at just that subtree, and say, well, here we have the uh, left subtree is in one circle, the root by itself, and then the right subtree in some other circle, and now, you know, WK is in some circle, because that was the right subtree of A. Now, how do we print WK? Well, K was the left subtree, W is the root, there is no right subtree, and we just progressively refine the detail, and then you can see here the traversal is Z, A, K, W, X, H, B, Q. And that would be the traversal for in order, so we can go ahead and write that on our slide as well. When we're listing traversals, we can say here that the in order traversal is going to be um, Z, A, K, W, X, H, B, Q, which is exactly the order we had gotten when we looked at things on the previous slide. So, the other question is, well, how do we deal with uh, post-order? And so let's lay that sort of template down again that we need to fill in. And now, given those blank spaces, let's fill in the rest of it. So now, instead of pre-order or in-order, this will be called post-order. And aside from that, the only difference is that our visitation line, which is an output in this case, is going to be at the end of the recursive calls rather than before them or in between them. And so what that means then is that your pattern here is everything in the left subtree followed by everything in the right subtree I mean, let me followed by the root. Then what we have here is then how do we do the left subtree? Well, we note everything in the left subtree followed by everything in the right subtree, followed by the root. Now, that's just one, no, regardless, that's just the root, so that you just print that. How do we print this tree out? Well, it's everything in the left subtree, which happens to be K, followed by everything in the right subtree, which is none that doesn't exist, followed by the root. And then K is just a one node tree, so we know what that is. And then here we say, well, this should be everything in the left subtree, followed by everything in the right subtree, and then followed by the root, and then it's clear what those tree traverses would be, because we have only one node in each subtree. So again, this progressive refinement idea. Get the left-right root pattern established, and then refine the left and refine the right. And so that's what we've done here. And so the post-order traversal is going to be K, or Z, K, W, and then now with both subtrees, then we can print out A, then H and Q, and with both subtrees, then we can print out B, and then finally X. Leaving us with the idea that the total uh, traversal is going to be for post order. Again, it's post order, not just post, but I'm just abbreviating it here because I don't have tremendous amounts of room. Z, K, W, A, H, Q, B, X. And so that is the post order traversal of the tree. And so you see these three uh, traversals are, are basically a very similar code pattern. You're just changing where the output goes. And so you can sort of look at this as having very similar groupings here. Roots, here's everything in the left subtree, here's everything in the right subtree. And the left and right sub whoops, the left and right subtree pieces tend to stay together very similarly. So we have here left subtree, right subtree with X there, left subtree, right subtree, and X by itself. So these pieces still stay together. Everything in the left subtree is bunched up, everything in the right subtree is bunched up, the root is by itself. It's just a matter of well exactly what order those fall in. So the A, Z, W, and K are in different orders here, but they always come before the B, H, and Q, and then the X is before everything, in between them or after them, depending on pre and post, post order. So that's, that's those three. And notice they're all going to be, let's look for the post order code back up, all of these, as uh, though it might not be immediately clear, are going to be order N. 
Uh, we're not going to really prove this mathematically. That's more of a 273, CS273 topic, um, and the, the mathematics involved there. But if we look at this code segment, um, let me push it over just a bit. If we look at this code segment, what we see is a couple recursive calls, and that might throw us, and like I said, that's really for, for the detailed math proof of the running time, that's best left for 273 and recurrence relations. But I, we can at least sort of give you a gut level feeling of why this is going to be linear time. Um, you might look at it and say, well, if I'm visiting every node, then it must be linear time. And so that's, but that's, that's clear. But then you look at this code and you say, well, what about these recursive calls? You know, it's kind of a, a nasty thing to, to try and worry about those. And it might not be immediate clear, immediately clear what we should be doing with regards to those. And what we can point out here is, well, keeping in mind we, you know, for example, that we have null pointers where we don't really have, show any, uh, any children, what we'll have here is nine null pointers. The rule for any tree, though you don't need to worry about this for, our, for this class, is that there's always one more null pointer than there are nodes. So there's, um, we have now, I've drawn here a total of nine null pointers because we had eight nodes. I'll really fit this all on the screen. So uh, the idea then is imagine what you're really doing is you're running this code once on every pointer in the tree. Once for the root, once for the pointer to A, once for the pointer to B, once for the pointer to Z, once for the pointer to W, to H, to Q, to K, and to these nine null pointers. The point being that if you only have one more null pointer than real nodes, the total number of pointers you're dealing with here is 2n plus 1. If you have n nodes in the tree, you have a pointer to each of these nodes in the tree, plus you have the additional n plus 1 calls you make to the, on these null pointers where you return right away. So you have a total of 2n plus 1 recursive calls from the first call to root to the individual calls on the null pointers that end things. And each of these recursive calls is constant time. You have a simple if statement to check things, you have an output, and then you invoke two function calls. And you don't really need to think about this in terms of, well, wait a minute, I have this huge recursive call before I finish, how do I take that into account? You know, from x, let's say tn points to x. Well, when I call x on, you know, tn, when I call post order on x's left pointer, I've got this entire tree what about all that work? And the answer is, well, that's done by the other post order calls. So if I sort of think of attaching a post order call to each of these nodes and to each of the pointers to nulls, there'll be two n plus one of them total, one on each pointer. And all your function call is doing is transferring, transferring you from one post order call to the next. So all you have here is, well, I've got code here. And when I call post order on t and arrow left, I jump down to the running the code on a and run that from start to finish and then come up. And as part of running the code on A from start to finish, I'll run it from start to finish on each of these. Eventually, I'll come back to A and finish that off. And eventually, I'll, I'll come back to X and finish that off. So the entire running time will involve simply running this code from start to finish on each of these nodes. And uh, the running, the, all the function call actually does is say, well, in the middle of running poster on X, I'm going to switch to running it on, on A. So ignoring the time spent trying to return from these function calls, it's constant time from start to finish, and you have 2n plus 1 of these, and all the functions do is move you from you know, what the, this function call running from start to finish on x to the one running from start to finish on a. But ultimately, every, the post order function will run from start to finish on every single pointer there. So um, since this is constant time, you simply have the, the, the 2n plus 1 post order calls plus you have you know, any time needed to transfer back and forth from you know, function one to the, to the second call of the, the, the post order function. So um, that's why recursion tends to take a little longer. You've got these extra function calls. Uh, and, and so you've got this extra time taken of transferring from one function to the next. But ultimately, this is uh, going to be order linear time because you're basically just running post order on every, every pointer there. And there's a linear number of pointers. If you have n nodes, you'll have on the order of n pointers, 2n plus 1 to be precise. You don't really need to worry about those details. Uh, my concern here is that you simply understand that post order and pre order and in order will be linear time. But for those of you inclined to, to want more explanation than that, I've tried to give you at least a better than hand waving explanation here. But the best thing to do would be to, run the, to, to take a theory course and, and actually run the math and do the recurrence relation. I've given you a sort of a hand waving explanation as best I can. Um, of why these traverses are linear time. 
the goal is to understand it, to, to realize that they are linear time, so that, that way you know if I'm going to base an algorithm off of them, such as a search algorithm, then that would be linear time as well. Now, though we can traverse many other ways, these are basically three ways that take advantage of the structure of the tree. So they're ordered to some degree, and the, the, the idea that, you know, uh, the structure of the tree suggests traversals such as these, rather than just randomly jumping, say, from H to A to B to K to X. So in the same way that the structure of a linked list or an array suggested a particular traversal order, these are three possible traversal orders suggested by the tree. There's one more that probably jumps to mind immediately, or at least might jump to mind immediately, and that's the idea of level order, and that's just traversing the tree level by level. And I'll just write out the answer before we look at the code. We have the depth 0 node, which is x. A and B are depth 1, so print out those from left to right. Then everything here from left to right, DWHQ. Then everything here from left to right on depth of 3. Then depth 4 from left to right, depth 5 from left to right, and so on and so forth until we have no more nodes. And you notice, of course, here, since Z didn't have any children, there was nothing to print here. We just jumped right to K. And likewise, if H hadn't been there, if B, B's left pointer had been null, we would go from Z to W to Q right away. So we don't have to have a complete or a perfect tree. We don't need to have all these nodes there. We simply go from left to right along, along a certain depth. And whatever we happen to hit in order, that's what we print out. So X and then A and B and whatever happened to be of depth 2. So if H wasn't there, we would be Z, W, and Q. But H is there, so instead of Z, W, H, Q, and then anything that happens to be there. There are no children of Z, so we don't have to worry about that, but we do hit K. That's level order traversal. And that is a bit trickier to code because we can't make use of recursion. Any use of recursion that we want to do requires that we be able to say the solution to a subproblem is the same as the solution to an overall problem. And that was the case for these three. The same way I traverse the entire tree, well, that's the same way I traverse a left subtree or a right subtree. The, the uh, left recursive call, right recursive call, printing the root in the proper place in between those recursive calls, that works the same whether we have the whole tree or just an individual subtree. But for level order, we can't do that because if I'm going to say, for example, do a level order traversal of this, the left subtree here, that gives me A, Z, W, and K. Depth 0 of this particular subtree depth 1 of the left subtree, depth 2 of the left subtree, considering this is my whole left subtree of x. So that means this is depth 0 of that subtree 1 and 2. And this is not a prefix anywhere in there. That is, running level order on the entire left subtree before looking at the right subtree is not a solution. I have to keep jumping from a to b, then from these two to those two, and then to k. I can't run everything here all the way down to k before printing out b and h and q. It doesn't work like that. And so recursion is not going to be of use to us here. So the question is, how do we make use of this? And inevitably, when you know, you talk, I talk to the whole class as a whole, the solutions that come up always involve trying to look at, well, look at X's left child first, and then look at its right child, and then go a little further. And all the solutions always involve, or the suggestions almost always will involve, trying to somehow, from the root, go down this far and then that far. And they don't, these solutions don't scale well. The idea being that, yes, on X's level, I have only a left and a right child. So you could just jump back and forth between them. But then you go a little deeper, and I have to get these two before those two. And then if there were more nodes, I'd have to get Z's children, and then W's children, and then H's children, and then Q's children. So I'm needing to continually jump around various trees, and now you go even later. Even if I, if I have the ability to look at, given a node, look at its left and right child, I'm having to jump across more of those nodes. And that's the problem. From the root, I can easily look at its left and right child, but then trying to get to Z and W and H and Q is a difficult. And then getting, jumping from these to these to these to these, if there was a thir another level of children, that would be harder still. And the more, the deeper we go, the more nodes I have in one row, and thus the more pairs of children I have in the next row. And trying to jump across from one pair to the other becomes somewhat difficult. So you can't just hard code, oh, look at the left and look at the right and look at the left again and look at the right again. Because when I look at the left again, I'm saying, well, now I have two nodes to worry about. And when I look at the right again, I've got two nodes. And then when I look at, look at the left again, I could potentially have four nodes. And I look at the right again, I potentially have four nodes. So just jumping from left to right to left to right to left to right is not a, a, a way that really works well because every time you jump from left to right, you have then double the nodes on one level that you had to worry about the last time. And so we need a, we need a sort of a, a means that takes that into account rather than just saying, oh, just jump back and forth.
because we have more and more smaller subtrees every time we, we move down one level. The other possibility is to do a pre-order traversal and simply say, do pre-order and print out everything at depth zero, and then do a pre-order and print out everything at depth one, and then do a pre-order and print out everything at depth two. And that's certainly possible, and what you'd end up doing is over and over again, you, you do a pre-order traversal of this tree. And so that would uh, be, you, you do a pre-order traversal for basically the entire height of the tree. For if there, here we have a height three tree, so you have do a pre-order and print out everything at zero, and then one, and then two, and then three. And w if you do enough, enough of those, um, depending on how the tree is arranged, that's potentially going to be quadratic time. And we want to be able to do this in linear time, so quadratic time is unappealing. So that would work, but it would take way too long. So the solution here, so that at least those then the suggestion there is those are some of the methods that, that people come up with. And there are certainly good attempts, uh, but, but ultimately they don't always work to our satisfaction. Uh, they either don't work or they don't extend themselves well to deeper trees or they take way too long. And the secret to solving this is to recognize that if I somehow had a collection of all the nodes on level X, say level 2 in this case, then I can easily retrieve the, the nodes in level 3, or the level x plus 1, the level below that, by looking at their children. So if I had a list of all the nodes in one level, I can traverse that list one by one and look at their children, and that would be the nodes in the next level. Which meant if I kept the nodes in a particular level in a queue, I could traverse, go down a queue, I could day queue elements from that queue one by one, and as I look at them, I could say put their children on the queue. That is, if I want to make level order traversal work, I don't even need to pass anything in here. So I don't need a public and a private version. I can declare a queue, and I can say, what's the root on the queue? And then say, as long as this queue still has values in it. So while it's not the case that the queue is empty, what I can do is I can say, I have a value equal to whatever is day queued from the queue. So pull a value off the queue, and as long as that is not a null pointer, so the queue will be storing uh, pointers, there'd be an e-type here. I'm just sort of, you know, rough pseudocode here. I'm not filling in the type. As long as val is not null, then I will say take out the element, and then On Q, and on Q, L, right. And that's basically all there is to it. Let me make sure everyone can see that. The writing got a little small on the slide here, but you should be able to see it on your own HTML slides. So the idea here is we have a Q, and the very first thing we do is on QA pointer to X. And then you say, okay, day Q that and print out X, or say day Q that, and since it's not pointing to null, print out X, and on Q X is left and right children. Then day Q this pointer. And since it's not null, we print it out and on Q its children, which are Z and W. Then day Q this, and that pointer points to B, which is not null, so we print it out and on Q the children. Then we day queue this pointer, and that is not pointing to null, so we print out its value and add its left and right ch children, and those, of course, are null, so we add those to the queue, and so on and so forth. And what will happen here is now Z's children, which are both null, get put on, then W's children, which will be K and null, get put on, then H's and Q's, which are also null, get put on. So by the time Q has been day queued and we finish processing on it, what we'll have is null, null, K, null, 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 because that's, those are the children of Z, W, H, and Q. No, no, K, no, 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 no. And so then for seven of those day queues, we value this condition would be false. We'd skip all, over all that. For the third one, however, third of the eight, we would have run into a pointer to K, which would not be null. So we would run this stuff. We would print out K and then on Q, it's two null children onto the queue. So the idea here is, given a collection of elements in the queue, as we day queue them one by one, we'll add their children. And then as we day queue those children one by one, we'll add their children. And as we day queue their children one by one, we'll add their children. And so a given pass across a level puts all the children of the level below that on the queue. 
and then a given pass of that level then puts their children on the queue, and so on and so forth. And so doing things this way will allow us to do a level order traversal, and this likewise should be a linear time because we're simply dequeuing each value from the queue once. We're going to unqueue it once because everything basically pops on the queue once, or gets put on the queue once and is removed from the queue once. And this entire loop, all the loop does is it checks each time to see if it's empty. So the, the processing here between the loop condition and that condition check is constant time. So the work we, we, we are repeating other than the day queues and on queues is simply constant time work, the while loop, the if condition, and the see out. We do that once for every node, and we on queue and day queue once for every node. And so since it's all constant time work, we do a constant time amount of work for every node, and therefore the entire thing is linear, just as pre and post or in, and uh, in order were. So that's level order. And that said, that's the end of the traversals. Those four will come into play again here and there. But what we're going to be looking at next time is um, a means by which we might organize a tree to search faster. Because if we're going to use either any four of these traversals as a basis for a search algorithm, as we've already said, since each of these four traversals is linear time, a search algorithm based off of them would be linear time. You search all the nodes of the tree one by one until you have either found or confirmed your value is not in the tree just as we had to do for a list. We searched the list or the array until we either found the value or confirmed it wasn't there. And so uh, next time we'll talk about binary search trees and try and enhance our ability to search a little bit more. See you then.